Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Next up, we have Joe Hummel uh, at University of California, Irvine. And he'll be speaking on big data processing on the cheap. Take okay. it away. Thanks, Chris. So good morning. Uh, so a little bit of an introduction. I, I'm a software guy. I'm not a, a, a data scientist or a necessarily you know, in a particular field. I'm, just, I'm a computer scientist. I, I build tools. I work with tools. So I thought it would be interesting, at least I thought it would be interesting, to talk about at least a few of the tools that people uh, can and do use to, to look at data, and in particular, big data. So, so that's what I'm gonna, gonna focus on. Okay, so the agenda is, there's lots of tools out there, lots of software, what I, I, I just picked three that I thought were interesting, and that sort of tied together in, in, into a talk. So the first one is Power Pivot, it's a plugin for Microsoft Excel, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that and its pros and cons. Uh, then I'm going to dip down and do some programming. And originally, I, I had intended to do Python, so that the uh, abstract says Python. At the, at the last minute, I changed that because I, I, I found something that I thought fit actually the talk and, and uh, what I was trying to achieve much better. So I'm going to use Link, and I'll explain what that is if, that, if you don't know. And, it, and I'll work in C Sharp and .NET. So, but it's not Python. It's, it's something else. Uh, and then the third one is I want to use Hadoop. So that we'll end up with Hadoop as our third uh, example. So what I'll do is talk about the trade-offs first, pros and cons, kind of, you know, why you would pick one over the other. And then what I mostly want to do is demo this. So this is always dangerous. I'm just going to, I got lots of notes in case I, I, get, I get way off track. But um, what I want to do is live demo all these things and play with it. And you can sort of see how, how they work. And, and, and for good or bad, that's what we'll do. And, I'm, and we're going to actually use Hadoop over the Internet. So hopefully that will stay up and uh, make that work. So, Okay. So how big is big? Uh, as we saw, the last speaker was talking about terabytes of data. And I think you know, big, da big data is getting quite large now. So, you know, but for some folks, it's megabytes. Other folks, that's trivial. Gigabytes is trivial. So what, you know, these different tools will sort of compare and contrast where it fits into big data. So gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, what are you working with? And then that will, in many cases, limit the tool that you can, that you can use. So I'll start with uh, just a quick uh, compare and contrast of these three techniques that I want to talk about. So Power Pivot is this plugin to Excel. The, the, the advantage of this is that it's, there's no real programming, at least on the surface. You can do some programming because it's Excel, and you can build your own sort of formulas and things. But uh, on the, for most people's uses, there's no programming. And of course, you have all the UI elements of Excel and, and the visualization, graphing, and things. Um, the con, the trade-off, is it's not a really scalable solution. And I'll talk about what that is and, and how the tool works. But it's really limited by how much memory you have in the machine. So I'm going to be using Power Pivot here. I'm limited by how much RAM I have. But you know, you can just buy more RAM, right? So, so it's, it's a very nice tool. There's the limit to just how far it scales. So it's really targeting, I would say, gigabytes of data. But it works with those gigabytes very nicely, as you'll see. OK, the second one is, is, is Link. And so that's, more, that's a programming approach. So the advantage here is the flexibility. So we can basically program and solve and get whatever we need out of the data. So the flexibility is the good thing. The con, of course, is now you're actually programming real software. So you know, if you're not a programmer, then that might you know, be a struggle at first. The target here is this gets us up into uh, you know, larger data sets, potentially, gigabytes and maybe ter terabytes. Uh, here you're going to be, again, limited by the, the size of your machine, the machine you're using to, to run those, those codes, the, the programs, the software you're building. And then the last one, of course, is Hadoop. I suspect everyone knows what Hadoop is. But uh, what I want to do is maybe you've heard of it but never used it. So we'll actually uh, program that and, and, and watch it run. So the, the real, I think, advantage of Hadoop is just the sheer scalability of it all. You can scale it as large as you need. You just need enough hardware. So you can install Hadoop on your personal laptop. You can install it on your own set of clusters. You don't need fancy hardware. You can just put it on regular machines. Or, you know, like uh, Azure, you could have you know, warehouses full of machines to, to run your Hadoop code. So it's, a, it's an easy programming model, and it's, very, and it's incredibly scalable. Uh, the cons are you, you do have to, ooh, ooh, sorry. Uh, you do have to 
fit into the framework. It's a MapReduce framework, so we'll, we'll see that. And it's not necessarily fast. It's not about speed. It's about processing the data. You can make it fast, but you've got to throw more hardware at it. So it's not necessarily a real-time engine, a fast engine. It's, a, it's a, more about a scalable engine. But this scales to basically whatever you need, so as big as you need to go. So you can scale it on your own machines or go to the cloud. I'll use the cloud today to, to demo Hadoop. Okay, so I had a hard time with this because uh, I want to find a data set that was interesting and big that it was interesting, but not so big that everything took forever and it took too long to look at anything. So, so, so and then I wanted something, I, I wish I had something happier, but you know, you're visiting Chicago, and the last thing we should talk about is crime. Um, I actually live here, so, but, so for me it was interesting because I thought, oh, you know, I never really look at the crime data. And I was actually surprised it was all on there. So city, the, I, probably most cities are doing this, but um, you know, a lot of this data is getting out and, and in the interest of transparency, they're making it visible to the public now. So Chicago has a nice site, that's the second link here. Um, the second link here is the, basically the overall city of Chicago data site. There's a lot of nice stuff in there. I'm gonna start sending my students there to, to do some assignments. But, but the first URL is the, the, the data from, uh, the, the, in particular, the public safety or the, or the police. So, so what we have is the crime, and I'll zoom in here in a second, but basically we have uh, the crime statistics from 2001 for just the Chicago area, not the suburbs. And it's about a gigabyte in size, and it's got about five million rows. And basically each row is, a, is an incident, and they record where it happened, so you can map it, what happened, and was anyone arrested, and so on and so forth. So, um, So that's, that, that's the actual site there, so I just surfed to it, so it does exist. What I did was, let me, let me just zoom in and, uh, okay, so, so what you can see is there's a case number, there's the date that the crime occurred, and then in particular, what I'm going to do is look at, sort of the city has categorized what it was, okay, so this first one's a burglary. What I'm going to do is actually focus on the, what's the IUCR, which is the Illinois Uniform Crime Reporting Code. So that's like some things that's across the state. Okay, that's the code for burglary, at least in, for the state of Illinois. So I'm going to mess around with that column, and we're going to play, play with that in particular. And then we'll bring in some of those other fields um, uh, as, as the demos proceed. So that's the idea. Um, but we're going to focus on those codes. Okay, and again, it's about a gigabyte, and there's... Five million rows. So you can play with all this online. I mean, they have a really, this is a really nice site. You can map it, and they put the map behind it and show you where the crimes are more and less and things like that. But it's about five million rows. Now, what I did was I just went over here to export and downloaded the CSV file, comma, separated file. So I just grabbed the, data, the raw data file and, and put it locally. So there it is there. So it's about a gig and five. So when I, I'm going to be working with it locally for a couple of the demos, and then for the Hadoop demo, I uploaded it to the, to the cloud, and then we'll work with it from there. So, but that's the raw file there, and some other files we'll use. Okay. All right, so the first demo is PowerPoint. Let me start off with the uh, the 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 nice plugin where there's, very, there's, all, there's no programming in this demo. So, uh, so you download this from powerpivot.com. It's, it's a plugin for Excel, it's free. Uh, so if you own Excel, have a license for Excel, then you can just plug this in at, at no charge. And essentially what it does, I mean Excel is a nice engine in itself, but it's a two-dimensional spreadsheet. What this plugin does is builds basically an in-memory database. So it turns the spreadsheet, or it turns the data, I should say, when you load the data into it, it builds basically a multi-dimensional data set in memory. So it builds an in-memory database, or an OLAP cube, if you want to, you know, that's the official term. But it's building uh, an in-memory database, and, and we'll see that when we start working with it. Now the thing, if you, if you do play with this, you want to be a little careful, because uh, you, you want to, depending on how big your data is, because I ran into this when I, start, when I first started playing with it. Most people install if you don't pay attention to it, you install the, the normal 32-bit Excel. 
But of course, there's a 64-bit 60 64-bit version that allows you to work with bigger data sets. So if you're working with big data, you want to use the 64-bit version of, of Excel, and then you want to install the 64-bit plugin for, to, to match. And if you don't know how to find that out, it took me a while, uh, file menu help, that tells you what version of Excel you have, and then you can download the appropriate plugin or reinstall Excel for the 64-bit. Okay. So let me show you what I'm going to do. Basically, one of the hard things with, with, it, with this is it's all point and click. So I'll, I'll try to do it slowly, but you, know, you just have to go back and play with it. But the good news is it's, it's very easy to play with. So the basic idea of how, of how this is, you're going to install Power Pivot. That's the first thing you have to do. And then what you'll get now is this Power Pivot menu. And that will appear in the menu bar of, or the ribbon of, of, of Excel. And then there's a window called the Power Pivot window. And then you will hit that window, that button, I should say, and you'll get these two little buttons that are the key ones. Get the data that I need that will load it, and then I hit this pivot table button, and that lets me start playing and, and analyzing the data in, in multi-dimensional ways. So that's what, let's, let's, let's play, and then I'll, let's go from there. So out of PowerPoint and into Excel. So there's the Power Pivot window. Power Pivot menu, Power Pivot. What I want to do is just show you the loading process. Uh, I'm going to load a smaller file. And let me talk about, and then I'll talk about it. So I'm going to load just the crime data for 2012. So what I do is I point to the text file. It does a quick analysis of like the first 50 rows or something to try to figure out the types. So you can see there's a little, it's a smart little engine. You can say, hey, look at the first row and figure things out. Give names to my columns. And then I can hit... When I'm, if I'm happy with this, I hit finish. What it's going to do now, now it's importing the data from that text file and building the in-memory database. So it's building the OLAP cube in memory so that I can start manipulating this data much more efficiently than I could if I was just using it in a two-dimensional spreadsheet kind of way. So, so that was about a 50 megabyte file, and it imported it, I don't know, 15 seconds or something. So I wanted to do a small demo, and I'll tell you how long the, the big one takes. Okay. Once I've imported it, now the data is memory resident. I can save it as part of the spreadsheet. And when I exit, I come, in, I come back in, and it's reloaded. I don't have to do this every time. I just pay this hit once. So I load the data once, and then it builds the cube in memory, and then saves it out in a compressed form. So the next time I come into Excel, it, it's, it loads up much quickly. Okay. Now, I was going to make you all sit through it, but I thought uh, it was probably not an appropriate use of time. So. Um, so that was a small data set. So let me look at. So what I did was the, the, the gigabyte data set takes about three minutes. I didn't want to sit here for three minutes and watch it. So I just thought I'd tell you that. So if you, a, a gigabyte of data takes about three minutes to load into PowerPoint. So what I did is I preloaded the data into the spreadsheet. You can see it gets compressed. So it's about one third the size, at least in this case. So it's a 300 megabyte file. So it, it built the model. And then I saved it immediately, and didn't, I didn't do anything else to it. So basically, I just preloaded the data, took three minutes, and then it's available now when I need it. So I'll just repeat the process. I'll go to Power Pivot, Power Pivot window. Now what it's doing is I don't have to load the data, because I already did. It's just taking it from its saved state and rebuilding the, the, the cube or the multidimensional data set. OK, so there's the data now. It's already been written. OK, so let's play with it. So the idea is load the data. So I got the external data. Now we go to pivot table, and here's where we can start to play with things. So this is the main sort of UI for playing with, with data in, in Power Pivot. So you have sort of this is where the output will appear. And what it's done now is it's, a, it's, this is, it's, a, it's, a da it's an in-memory database. So here's the, the table that I loaded from, the, from Chicago, the Chicago crime data. So I care about the, this code. Those are the codes for the crimes. And what I want to know is, so what I did was I dragged the field that I care about into the summation field down on the bottom right. Basically, I want a count of every crime. So whatever crime 0110 is, 110, whatever crime that is, there were 5,167 of them uh, over uh, the, the last 10 plus years. 
I want to see what are the really, uh, what, yeah, what are the worst crimes? So I'm going to sort them high to low. Okay, so 486, there were 300, 350,000 of those in 10 years. That's, that's a lot, 35,000 of those a year. Um, okay, so let's just focus on the top 10. Okay, it's just, I'm going to start graphing stuff. It makes it easier if we just focus on the top 10. So, so what I see are the top 10, top 10 crimes in the last 10 years in Chicago. Okay, I got the codes, not real interesting with just code numbers. I'd like to kind of know what they are. So what I'm going to do, so I Googled what these codes were, and of course there's another website which had the data there, which was very cool. So what I did was I downloaded the data that basically said what each of these codes is. And it's just a little, another text file. What I'm going to do is load that as into, into Power Pivot. So let's go ahead and load that. So that's this file here. I just went to the Illinois website and grabbed that text file. It's a small one. It's only 15K or something. So what I'm going to do is load this into. So, I, so the point here is I can load more than one data set. Uh, you know, it's a database. I can load lots of tables. So I'm going to load, oops, oops control Z. Ah, thank you. And let's just load that one up. So that was real fast. It's only 300 rows. So close that. And now you can see, at least from this little tab view, I have two data sets in here. So what I want to do is now is connect these tables because there's a relationship to them. Create relationship between the two tables. So I have my master table, which has this code column. And then I will have this other table, which is basically my lookup. So I can use this other table to look up the textual description of what those crimes are. OK, so now the two tables are in memory, and I've related them. So I'm going to go back to my over here. So now up on the top right here, you'll see it says, hey, there's, there's things changed. So we'll refresh that. And now in my list of things I can play with, the data, I have a second table. What I'm going to do is drag primary description down here. And now what we actually see is oh, it's doing a lookup automatically. So 486 is a battery. OK, so and then theft and battery, criminal damage, criminal damage. If I drag down secondary description, I want that one below that. Can I get that? Oh, hold it. Being a goof. There we go. Come on. Okay, maybe it's not going to happen for me. All right. But now we see what kind of theft it was. Okay, so there's a $500, that was the theft there. Criminal damage to vehicle, criminal damage. So we get some sense of what the actual crimes were. OK. All right. OK, so let's a couple more demos, and then we'll, a couple more things you can do. So this is really just the tip of the iceberg. So let's see, we can graph this. I don't think I'm still in top 10, am I? All right, let me just jump. Okay. So let's, let's put year to this. So now what I can see is the crimes by year. So now I get some sense of what they were like per year. And then this gets interesting because now I can start to graph these things. And I'm running out of, I can get rid of that, right? Yeah. But you know, this is what, what Excel brings to the table, is that you know, the, the pivot gives us the processing capability, then Excel gives us the ability to start graphing these things. So now I can look at, looks like crime's actually decreasing. That was a nice result to see. It looks like the little bars are going down. And then the last thing let me show you that I thought was really, really very slick here. is there's, these, there's, this tech, there's this UI element called a slicer. Where did it go? I lost 
the insert slicer. And what this allows you to do now is slice the data. So I can just pick 2002, or I can pick maybe every five years, 2002, 2007, oops, sorry, 2002, 2007, and uh, 2000, let's just pick nine. So I can pick a couple years, and it right, slices up the data, recomputes things, and then now graphs it. So that's the idea of Power Pivot. Load the data in, builds a sophisticated in-memory database, and then starts to let you analyze the data. So that's Power Pivot. Okay. I'll leave that there in case. Actually, I won't. And then I'll just save it out there in case for the other, get it off, off the screen. So I'll save it out there, and then you can just come right back in and play with it next time you want to. Okay. Let that save in the background. Okay. Okay, so that's power, that's power pivot. Let's look at LINK. So LINK is more of a programming approach now. LINK stands for Language Integrated Query. And what this is, is the idea of, loosely, you take SQL and make it part of your programming language. So now you program with SQL with the support of also the programming language around you. And this is part of, of .NET, which is uh, freely available from, from Microsoft, Microsoft.NET Framework, or on other platforms, you can use the Mono project on, on Linux, Mac, and on Windows as well. So this is also freely available uh, technology. So what Link looks like, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna process the same data and we're gonna basically generate the same results. I'm gonna look at those codes and get the descriptions for the top 10. This is basically what the code looks like. So, so now I'm actually in a language programming, and, but I program in an SQL-like way. So what I'm gonna do is say for each crime, group those, and, and we're gonna see this again when we talk about Hadoop. We're gonna group the crimes, uh, basically just do a, like a, an SQL group by, but we're gonna group the crimes which will then count them up for us. So what happens with this step here is when you group the data, we group it by the code, and what we get are counts. And that's just part of what group means. I, can, I group the, the things that are similar, and then it will count them for me if I want. So then I get groups, I get the codes and their counts. Then I, what I can do is sort them into descending order, and then I can uh, select out the data that I want. So I'll sort it, and then select out the key, which is the code from the group, and the count of, which is also from the grouping mechanism. So the end result is what we're gonna see is sort of what we saw in the raw data of Excel. We're gonna see codes, and we're gonna see um, the, the counts, how many times that crime occurred. No. Now, I'm gonna use this, this package called link to CSV, which does some very nice processing of the, of the CSV files for us. You can do it by hand, I'll show that, I think if I have time, but if not, uh, by default, there's a lot of nice tools out there that, that look at the first row to see if there's a header row there and do some nice error checking for you. So I'm gonna use that here in the demo, and then I'll, 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 I won't use it the second time and for performance reasons. Okay, so let's see if I can remember. Okay, so what I have is the sh I have the skeleton of the application. The application is probably about 50, uh, I don't even know if it's 50 lines of code. Maybe three screenfuls, yeah, that's 60 lines of code. So uh, it's not very long to do this, and then uh, and that basically just open the file, I'm gonna process it, and then there's some output statements to, to generate the result, or to visualize the result. So I'm just gonna type the code that was on the PowerPoint slide. So crimes is basically the set of data that this package is processing for me. So from, for each crime in the data set, I wanna group uh, the crime by the code uh, into these things called, into groups called G. So each group is called G. And then I wanna order, order by uh, G dot count, oops, not cast. Uh, descending, and then I want to select out. So I'm, or, I'm grouping, I'm order, I'm sorting, and then I want to select out what I want to display on the screen. So I want to select out. I'm giving a name to the key, 
and then count equals g dot count. Okay, control F5. Why not? Oh, okay. Last minute, oh, sorry. I was hacking last night doing my tests. Got ahead of myself. At least you know it's live. Okay. So what it's doing now is it's, anal it's doing what Excel was doing, but now I'm doing it using Link, this language integrated query technology. Now I didn't pick the top 10, I basically blasted through all of them. So let me, let, me, let me run out, let me just get the top 10, but it went through all of them. So var query2 equals query dot, I just want to take the top 10. So take those, now we should just see the top 10. Now, it's not actually that fast, so I'll explain that in a minute, but I'm processing a different data file just to say, well, I'll explain that. So, so that's the idea. That's Link. I'm going to do a little bit more with Link, but if you want, you can start you know, using the nuances or the power of the flexibility of the programming language to, to get at sort of intricate things that the tools don't provide, uh, or at least maybe Excel does not provide, or it's a larger data set that, that you can't load into Excel. So, but it's a similar sort of SQL database-like approach. All right, so let me do one more thing and then we'll talk about uh, big data processing here. So what I'd like to do now is, again, go back to getting a textual description instead of just a code. So what I need to do is do the join. I have to join, but I have to do it myself. I have sort of, you know, Excel, I loaded it and then clicked, made the relationships. Here, I got to programmatically do that. What I'm doing is just getting set up to load the second file. So now, now I can join the output that I've computed, the codes and their counts, with the actual textual description. So we have some meaning behind what these crimes actually are. So to do this, I need another query, and I'm basically going to do a join. So from the key value in crimes. So what we, oh, from the query to. What we have is from the previous query is a set of code and count. And what I'm going to do is join that with the codes, and the codes are these processing of this other data file, that other text file. Uh, key value, oh no, on, equals code dot, come on Joe, slow down, okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm now joining the two tables so I can get some more meaningful output, and then I have to select what I want to display to the screen. Select, and then I do the key value, uh, IUR, key value, count, and then I want the code.primary description and the code.secondary description. And now the output, I'm going to have the output come from query three. And then I'm going to output more data to the screen. Okay. 
So now what it should do is do the query from before, get the code, look at the crimes and their counts, and then do a join with that other table. So now we see the description. So now we see it's the first one's a battery, the second one's a theft. We saw that in Excel as well. So now I'm programmatically joining and, and, and doing that myself. But nice, what link gives us the advantage of, you know, the, the programming is pretty high level one, if, once you get used to it. So it's a more SQL-like programming, not, you know, tedious uh, if statements and, and necessarily while loops that stitch things together. So it's a higher level uh, programming model. Okay. Now, if you're a careful observer, you'll notice that these numbers are a lot smaller. There actually was 366,000 crimes in the, in, the, in the data set. So what I'm actually doing here is processing uh, the wrong data set. I, I'm, I'm pro processing a smaller one just so the demo didn't uh, take too long. So um, let me just show you what I did, and then I'll, I'll be honest now. So what I'm doing is I'm processing, a, it's about a 50 meg. It's the data set from 2012. So what I'm going to do now is run it on the real data set, which is the, um, now it's running on the one gigabyte file. So this will take about two minutes to do. Um, the reason for the, the, I can make it run much faster, and I'll show you how I do that. But the, 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 the trade-off is just that I'm using this package, and the package is building a lot of objects for me. It's a very nice package, but it's, it's just slowing things down. So it takes about two minutes to generate those results, and we'll let this sit here and run in the background. Um, so this is where, you know, if you want performance, you have to then play around a little bit. So what the PowerPoint says is, OK, so if you want a more efficient version, this will run in about 10 seconds. So close to the speed of what Excel was kind of doing, a little bit slower in Excel, but pretty fast. Um, what you need to do is, is basically this bit here. This is the part you have to do yourself, is you want to parse the file and, and tear it apart yourself. What the package was doing was doing the processing of the file and finding the commas for us. What I do is just do a split and then grab the data myself, and that really speeds things up. But the programming now is not quite as nice. You have to, you have to then program with Lambda expressions, and it's, it's a little bit uh, more sophisticated. But it, it achieves the same result in about 10 seconds instead of two minutes. And then if you really want to play, what you can do is put the as parallel in there, and it will go multi-core for you and see if that speeds things up. It does not speed anything up here because there's not enough. This is basically the data processing per, per element. And there's just not enough data processing for the parallelism to pay off. You need sort of more computation here for, for the data parallelism to work. So you don't get any speed up from saying as parallel. But one of the nice things about Link is its, is it's programming model, but also the fact that you can go multi-core and parallel very quickly uh, and just try it, see if it works. Just go as parallel. And then what happens is everything that follows is done in parallel, if possible. And then it will speed up if, 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 if possible. So I've seen that work really well. It just doesn't work well in this case. In this case. OK, still not done. It's trying. OK, should finish any second, though. Am I, I'm, how am I doing on time? OK, all right. We can pause for a question. There it goes. Go for it. <laughs> now let's take the question anyway. This is a good place to pause just for a second. So, all right, so you saw about two minutes. I would type the code, but in the interest of time, I can get it. It's about 12 seconds if I go write all that code, which I won't, I don't think. Go ahead. Go for it. I was just wondering if uh, the power pivot uh, also has uh, some options for parallel processing in it. Yeah, so good question about the parallel processing. It does. So Excel has a little checkbox for do things multi-threaded. And, it, and it's, it, I believe it's on by default. It was on for when I installed it on my machine. So this is a quad-core machine. And so, yeah, the, it, it will take advantage of that if it can. So I don't know if specifically if PowerPivot does, but Excel supports multi-core, and I would expect it to do it. But I don't know for sure. But it's, it's capabilities there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, given that Link is, as you said, similar to SQL, why not just use SQL? Fair question. Um, the, the, I guess the only issue would be where's the data coming from? So if it's already in a database, then go for it. You, I, sure, if you know SQL, then I would say, yeah, a lot of people do. And in fact, when we look at Hadoop, uh, they're going SQL-like as well. You can take advantage of that way. So I think SQ, SQL is still a good way to go and, and very appropriate. It just depends where the data is. If the data is in a text file, then I need some way to load it into something to make it look like a database and then play with it in SQL. So definitely that's a viable option. I think uh, 
maybe just for, to, to, um, you know, there's just a certain, some sense of movement afoot in the NoSQL movement, and there's also this movement of, okay, I, I, I don't want to buy into a, a, data, a database vendor, so I want to play with this just in its raw text form. What are other ways of doing that? But I think SQL is, a, is still a good viable option. Oh, yeah, true, true enough, yeah. Yeah, with the, yeah. Yeah, nothing wrong with it. I think that would be a fourth option. I just, you know, yeah, you know, but no, definitely nothing that would be a viable way to do it. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Okay, excellent. Okay, so we have about 10, 10 minutes. I don't know. I'm going until 12, I guess, if I have permission. So just, just leave if you want. So uh, Hadoop. So freely available framework for big data. Uh, Hadoop Apache.org. There's and you can install this locally on your machine. You can put it on your own cluster. You can put it on, use it in the cloud. And, uh, and I'm sure you've all heard of it. So it's based on the concept of map reduce. And this is not something that this is just what you know. This has been along forever in Lisp and, and functional programming and, and just in software in general. This concept of map reduce. And the idea is you have some data that you want to apply a function to. So you have a function, and I, I call it a search function, but it doesn't have to be. It was just, this is sort of was, it just became really popular with, with, with search engines, Google and Bing and things like that, where what the function was a search function. But what you're doing is just mapping a function. It could be adding two numbers together. But you're mapping a function across a data set and producing intermediate results. And, and, this, and this is why it's scalable, is because no matter how big the data is, you just you know, do all this in parallel across as many machines as you have, and you can just process enormous amounts of data. But the, but the framework is you have a function, you map it across the data to get intermediate results. And then there's a second step where you reduce, there's a second function, which takes those, uh, the results, and so let's suppose we were doing searching, you know, uh, internet searches, and then these would be your, your intermediate page hits. And then what you do is you reduce it into a ranking, and that's what Bing and, and Google show you, and that's the, uh, the result set page hits, sums of numbers, whatever you're map reducing across. So very simple concept, map function, reduce function, apply them in the sequence, and out pop the results. And it's, and it's really scalable because it, it has to be embarrassingly parallel. And by that I mean there's no communication uh, amongst the mappers and things. It's just you know, apply them across the data and then reduce the results down into the, in the second step. So that's map reduce. And that's what Hadoop is based on. So, so the workflow, just to, to, to put some concept to this, to what, what, what happens, is so the map, the, the goal of the map function is to generate key value pairs. And so this is the framework you have to, th you have to think in terms of this framework. So we've been doing this already. We had a code and a count. So, th so that's, I sort of set the stage for that. So, but you're, you're thinking in terms of key value pairs. Now what this, so the yellow is something you have to write. You have to write that map function. The systems typically provide a sorting function which sorts those into, it, it puts all the key ones and keys two and key threes, so it sorts them for you so they're next to each other. So you produce all these key value pairs and the system will sort it, and then really important step is the system will also merge it. And so what comes out of the system's provided steps is a key and a list of all the values. So what they do is they sort them so they're close together, and then they merge them into one key and a list of values. So key one would have a list of all the values from the output, key two, list of all the values, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's your job to decide what the final answer is. So then you come back into the equation, you write the reduce function, and the reduce function says, okay, I'm going to look at this key, I'm going to look at those values, and I'm going to decide what to do. And then you output for each key one final value. So you start off with sort of key value pairs and end up with key value pairs. And, and that's how the system works. And you have to think about your problems in that framework. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, is use Hadoop on, on, on Azure. Oh, getting ahead of myself. So, and, and what's nice about this is it's free. So they give you a little Hadoop cluster to play with. And, um, and you, get a, you get an invitation code, and you can, I think, get six clusters, and they, each one lasts for five days. So it, gets you, it allows you to play for free uh, with Hadoop. So uh, let's see if the internet connection is still alive. Okay, oh cool, all right, let's see how it works. So what I'm gonna do is sign in. If you wanna, you just, so what I did is I went to, uh, I'll show you the URL, Hadoop on Azure. So you go to that URL and there's, this is the page and you can get an invitation. You can just fill out the form, get a, get a code to, to sign up for free. And then I'll sign in. 
Oh, I'm already signed in. Okay, or at least. Okay, so there's my cluster, and I'm, I'm logged in. I have a cluster that's running, and it's, it's still mine for three more days. Then they take it back. So it's using Azure, so it's using cloud resources. So I'm going to click this nice little button, go to cluster, and that will actually take me to sort of like the control panel for, for my, uh, my cluster in Azure. And what you see are some Windows 8-like interface, Metro style, and then cr there's a create map reduce job down there at the bottom. So first thing I did was I went in here and I turned, you can see that this port is open. So the first thing I had to do was get my data up onto the, onto the, the system. So I opened up the FTP port and then FTP'd those files in. That took about 15 minutes. So I FTP'd in that one gigabyte file, so now it's stored locally uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on my little cluster. And I can see that using this handy interactive console. So what, I, what I'm doing here is listing the contents of the underlying file system, which is called HDFS, Hadoop file system. So I'm looking at what's up there on my cluster, and I have some data files and some scripts and some output, just in case things blow up, I can show you what's going on. And then I'll do a ls uh, data files. And we can see that I have some data files to play with. And they're the same ones that are on my laptop. I just FTP'd them up. Okay. Okay. Go back. All right. It'll go back in a second. So the, the, so the normal way you work with this is you write a map function and you write a reduce function. And there's various techniques. You can use JavaScript. You can use C++. You can, almost, you can pretty much use any language you want. It originally started with Java, but you can use almost any language you want. So what you would do is you would write your map function and your reduce function. You upload them. You know, that might be the jar file for Java or the exe for you know, C++ or C Sharp. Whatever, you upload your code, and then probably with FTP, or actually there's an easier way I'll show you. And then you submit a job. And, and so that's the traditional way. Map function, reduce function, upload the code, and then you submit a job, and you tell them, here's my map function, here's my reduce function, here's the data. And it, it runs the job and then shows you the results. So, so that's the traditional way to do it. Um, what I'm going to do, and I might need my notes for this, but uh, we'll see. We'll see how much I can do without. Is I'm going to just, you know, the, the ecosystem, the ecosystem around this is really evolving, really rapidly and, and really in powerful ways. So what I want to show you is sort of an, a, an easier way to do this. So I'm going to go down and back into this interactive console, and I'm going to use JavaScript, which is just an easier language because it's dynamically typed, and so it just, and then I can just upload it and submit it in a, in a very convenient way. So, so let's, let's flip back to PowerPoint for a second, and let me show you what I'm going to do. So, so the example, so what I'm going to do is use JavaScript, again, just because it's easier. And what I have to do is write two functions, first is map. And you can see, so what map is going to take in, I can't see it, uh, is the key thing is this parameter here. That's one line of the file. So, and then I'm supposed to output a key value pair. So what I'm going to do is, is take that line, which is comma separated data, and I'm going to split it. And then I'm going to write out the key, and I just it's and so the code is in field. It's the fifth field. That's that I that Illinois crime code. It's in the fifth field, but zero indexing, so it's four. So I'm going to grab the fourth, the fifth thing, field four, and and write out that's my key, and my value is one, one crime. And this is very common. You just write out the key that you're interested in, and, it, and you saw it one time. So that's my map function. Very simple. They're typically very simple functions. The reduce function then will take those that key, which will be the, the crime code, but remember what you get is a, is a list of values from the merge step. And then what your, your job is to take all the values and merge, reduce it to one value. So now what I have in this second parameter is a values field. Now what I'm going to do is sum those up. So for every value in the list, parse it because it's a string and add it to the sum. What I write out is the key, the code, and the count, or the sum of all the times that a crime occurred. So I'm doing what I did in Link and, and what I did in, in Excel. I'm just doing it now in, in, in uh, Hadoop, MapReduce framework. Okay. 
So values. So I think that's the map function. So we we split the value based on commas, and we get an array of values. I want the fifth one, which is four, and then uh, write that out. So in the interest of making this live, I'm just doing this live. So uh, now I need to sum it up. So this is the reduce function that sums up the list of values. I think that looks good. All right. So I'm saving that. So I'm doing this locally, by the way. I opened up a local text file, and I wrote this locally in JavaScript. Now what I'm going to do is upload this live to the cluster. So let's see how I do here. All right. So now I'm back at, at my cluster, and it's, this is an interactive uh, command line. So I'm going to do file system put. So what I'm going to do is I want to put a file up here, and this is just a nice, convenient way to upload files. So I'm going to browse to that script file. So there's the file that I just wrote, hopefully correctly, but if not, we'll look at the data. And then the destination on the cluster, scripts slash iucr dash count dot javascript upload. Okay. It's not normally this slow. This is just, uh, it should have been, boop, but. This is hotel Wi-Fi. Okay. Come on. Okay, it's still live. Okay, I don't know why it's still spinning, but there's the file here. It's still spinning up there, but okay. So here, this is the file I just uploaded, scripts, IUCR count. Okay. Still spinning, but it's all right. I'm gonna move forward. All right, so here's the fun bit. So now what I want to do is run the, run the MapReduce job. And this is, odds are I won't be able to type this right, so. And it's going to look surprisingly like the linked code, which looks surprisingly like SQL. So I'm using a language called PIG, or a technology called PIG. So this is part of the ecosystem that's evolving around Hadoop. So they have PIG and Hive and all these other things which are trying to make this system even easier to use. So PIG is an SQL-like like approach to, to Hadoop and MapReduce. So let's see, data files slash cc from 2001.txt. So I, I, I'm going to write a, a SQL-like clause. So PIG dot, where's my data? So I'm basically creating a job and saying where the data is. Data files cc, yep. And then I want to do a map reduce myself, so I will provide the script. And then I have to tell the system sort of the schema for, for what the output's going to look like. So give the columns some names. So load the file dot map reduce, run my script. Yep. And then I want to order by. It's not going to be right. Okay. 
All right, let's give it a shot. So what it's just done now is it, it, did, the, it did the work of doing the submitting, creating a map reduce job and now submitting it. So I now have a map. I have three nodes in my cluster. That's what we get for free. So I, I basically have now three map functions being set up and then a reducer uh, at the end when it's done. And there should be a little spinny thing over here if I can scroll over far enough. There it is. So it's working. But a better way to see that is job.list. So this is job number six. I was, you know, I've been just playing, testing things. So job number six, if I click that, it shows me sort of the status of what's going on. So some things are happening, and then if we sit here long enough, we can watch. I, for some reason, this doesn't update very quickly. So I'm going to get rid of that. Let me show you what should eventually happen. Let's see if job five. So job five here, this is the log file from the one I ran last night, just to make sure everything was fine. So this is all the MapReduce stuff that, that pops out, saying you know, what happened at each as it was allocating clusters and reading data files and things. So but let's see if it generated any output yet. No, OK. So the job has not finished, because I don't see the output file yet. Let me show you what the output looked like from the, the job last night. So let's see, pound ls just lists. So this is this kind of typical, there's some log files and stuff happening, but um, this, what you get is the output files are just sort of the, the raw text from the reducers. So there's one reducer, so it just puts out the Rs for the reducer, so it just that's the output from the, the reducer. Uh, Step so we can look at the contents of that. Pound cat uh, underscore output from two thousand one slash part. So that's the top ten crimes and and the count for each of those crimes, and those match the numbers we saw before three hundred sixty six thousand. So, so that's what the, you know, the, the low-level map reduce looks like. And then if I wanted to, and I knew we wouldn't have time, we'd do the join. Joins are a little tricky, because where do you do that? So you know, either you submit more map reduce jobs, or you do it as part of the mapping or reducing phase. So there's various ways to solve that. What, what, what's happening now with these other, this ecosystem, is they're giving, providing higher level ways to, to do common database things, like joins and, and sorting and, and things like that. Let's see if the other one finished yet. No, it still hasn't finished yet. I'm, I'm looking for the, the output file, which I don't see yet. It would say output from, not underscore output. So it hasn't finished yet. I think if you want speed, you have to pay. Or, so uh, anyway, all right. I think I've gone long enough. It's time for me to stop. Great. OK, oh, I'll finish the slide, sorry. Oh, OK. <laughs> sorry, Chris. <laughs> OK, so there's a, there's a rich ecosystem around that. What I was doing was PIG. There's some other examples of PIG, but there's Hive, there's HBase, Hadoop database. So it's a very rich uh, ecosystem. Hadoop on, on Azure, there's the link if you want to get an invitation to play with this yourself. Um, but there's other, you can you know, download uh, Apache version and install it locally. Uh, Hadoop connector, so a common strategy is going to be put your data in Hadoop to do the big data processing then, and then connect to it from Excel to visualize and graph it and play around with maybe in a smaller format. So, so Microsoft's working on connectors from, from locally your machine up into Hadoop to get results out. So that's kind of stuff that's coming. Um, that's it. And uh, that's me. The materials are up online, the slides and uh, the actual code and the database files and all that stuff's there if you want it. Uh, some other things to keep an eye on. There's another plugin coming for Excel called PowerView, which is even more sophisticated and powerful. And then there's the Hadoop technology coming to Windows and, and then the final version on Azure. So, and then lots of stuff just in the Hadoop space. So, okay, I've gone on enough. Now I'm done, Chris. Thanks. Great. Thank cool. you, Joe. Thank you. So I think we do have time for maybe, not, maybe a couple questions if, if anyone uh, has anything they want to ask. That's a pretty thorough demo. Thank you. I, I guess I have one just before um, we let you off to lunch. Um, this was a great example of uh, 
how to do kind of the same thing in different ways. Um, but certain of these tools are better for different um, kind of skill levels. Have you seen any um, interesting combinations of using these tools? So where yeah. you can take advantage of the different, um, the different ways of doing this? Yeah, good question. I think, I think Excel is a very common tool. Uh, and, and then PowerPivot just makes it much more powerful and accessible and faster. I think a very common approach is, is the Hadoop approach or something on top of Hadoop like Pig or something, and then visualizing it in a spreadsheet tool. That seems to be the most common way, or using maybe the processing language to visualize the data you get out of Hadoop. But those, to me, seem to be what I see as the most common in my sort of arena, is Hadoop for the big stuff and then bring it down and do it locally using a spreadsheet or a visualizing tool or processing. Great. Cool. Thanks, Chris. Great. All right, well, we had some questions in the middle, so I think yeah, we'll wrap we're good. it up. Yeah, Okay. Thank, thank you, everyone. Okay. Let's give a Thanks. last round of applause for everybody, uh, all the speakers. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. All right.